Hi guys, welcome to your classification video notes. So we're going to start off on this topic by simply asking why do scientists classify in the first place? So we've already learned a little bit about the reasons why early classification was incorrect. So now let's get into what we use today. So that original early solution used Latin names, but it was this huge long description. So for example, look at the red oak. We have one, two, three, four, five, six words meaning oak with leaves with deep black lobes bearing hair like bristles. Why is this a problem? Well, obviously it's way too long and it's impossible to show an evolutionary relationship because there's so many different components to the name. So someone by the name of Carl Linnaeus, he actually changed his name to Carolus Linnaeus to sound more Latin, but um, he devised a new system based on the morphology, which is an organism's form and structure. His classification had a hierarchy of different levels ending with a two-part name, which is referred to naming that as binomial nomenclature. So here's a look at the taxonomic levels. So we start with domain, then kingdom, then phylum, class, order, family, genus, ending in species. And a great way to remember this is down here at the bottom. Dear King Philip came over for great spaghetti. So the first letter of every word coordinates to this over here. When we talk about binomial nomenclature, the prefix bi meaning two, so it's a two naming naming system. And it's always gonna be italicized or when you're doing handwriting, it would be underlined. So the first name is going to be the genus and that first letter is capitalized. And the second name is going to be the species, which would be all lowercase. So if we look at our example here, homo sapiens or humans, you notice that the H is capital, the S is not, and it's two names. You don't wanna combine them into one. When we look at modern taxonomy, we do use Linnaeus' system, but there are additional kingdoms, which further organizes in the context of evolution. Now on to more with modern taxonomy, scientists use five different things to classify organisms. So we're gonna take a minute and explore each of these five things in more detail. Starting with the fossil record. So fossils, most of you know what a fossil is, I would hope. And that's just using those to trace changes over time. So the things that have been dead the longest are gonna be at the bottom of a sample and most recently died are gonna be at the top. We're also looking at the phylogeny here or the evolutionary history of the fossil over time. When we talk about morphology, we're talking about, like I mentioned previously, shape and function. There's two big things you need to know here and these are very commonly confused. So the first being analogous characteristics. These have different embryological, embryological origin. They're the same structure, but they, the, they have similar structure and function, but they're not the same. So an example would be a bird wing and a butterfly wing. Both of those organisms use wings to fly, but butterflies are insects and they're invertebrates and birds are vertebrates. So big differences there. A homolo homologous characteristic, think back to genetics, right? So homo means the same. So this is the same embryology with a similar structure and function, more specifically the structure. So when we think about a bat wing or a human arm, bats and humans are both mammals, so they both have the same bone structure, although we use them for drastically different things. So here's a closer look at that. So you see a human arm and a bat wing, and the bones are shaded different colors, showing you how they correlate to each other. And then here we have a bird wing and an insect wing, which are drastically different structures, but they both still use them for flight. When we talk about embryology, the root there is embryo. So the embryo is the developing baby of that animal or that organism. So the embryology is similar in animals that are closer related. So if you look at all of these animals listed at the bottom, you notice in very early embryology development, they look pretty much the same. There's some minor differences, of course, but later on, drastically different. Well, what do they all have in common? These are all vertebrates, or I'll say verts for short. So they all have a backbone and similar development. Chromosomes are also gonna show you close relationships. If you remember karyotypes from the genetics unit, this is showing all the chromosomes in your body. Well, this one over here is a human, 
So if we look, we have 22 pairs plus the sex chromosomes, which gives us 46. This one over here is a chimpanzee, which gives us 48. So they have 23 sets and then your XY there, resulting in 48. But there is a lot of similarity in number of chromosomes. And finally, macromolecules. So think all the way back to the first unit that we did, we talked about the major macromolecules. Well, proteins and DNA, or nucleic acids, are two of those macromolecules, and they show close relationships. So if you look at this chart here, we have a number of amino acids that differ from a human compared to these other species. So humans compared to a rhesus monkey, for example, only have an eight, a difference of eight amino acids. But then you look at a human and a frog, there's a difference of 67. So obviously humans are going to be more closely related to the rhesus monkey versus the frog. Now that we've talked about how scientists group things, we need to lay out a clear definition of species. Two things you need to remember. Members of the same species can, one, reproduce in a natural environment, and two, produce fertile offspring. So what about birds? People like to group birds all together, but there's lots of different species. So two birds, such as an ostrich and a hummingbird, cannot mate or produce offspring. Now we do get some animals sometimes when we cross two different species, but these are still not considered species. For example, horses and donkeys result in mules, like these guys here, but horses and donkeys aren't the same species, so how does that happen? And is a mule a species? No, mules are not a species because they are sterile, meaning they cannot reproduce. So you can mate a horse and a donkey and get a mule all the time, but mules are not identified as a species because you can't mate two mules to get a mule baby. What about dogs? Well, I'm sure a lot of you maybe even own a mixed breed dog. Dogs are different breeds, not species. So yes, they can all mate and dogs can also mate with wolves. What about a liger, everybody's favorite animal to talk about? No, ligers once again are not species. Two reasons. One, ligers, or you see a name here, tigons, are sterile. So they can't, you can't mate two ligers and get baby ligers. That's not going to happen. The second thing is lions and tigers don't even live in the same natural habitat. So that would also not qualify a liger as a species. The last thing we're going to get into is cladistics. So cladistics is showing shared characteristics and more of a graphical representation. Here's a basic cladogram that you might see, and we notice two things here. So we have something called an ancestral character, and there's only one of those in a cladogram. And then you have all of these, which are derived characters. And also you might notice that as you move up this, you get to organisms that are more complex. So a moss is not nearly as complex as a flowering plant like a lily. So each of the branches is going to represent a newly evolved feature. Let's take a look at this cladogram and see how you do. So first of all, which organisms have jaws? So first we need to find jaws, which is here, meaning everything above that line has jaws. So a better question might be which organisms don't have jaws and you would answer hagfish. Everything else, perch, salamander, lizard, pigeon, mouse, chimp, they all have jaws. Next, which organisms have claws or nails? Once again, we're going here and moving our way up. So now we have lizards, pigeons, mouse, and chimp. So they all have claws or nails. And then lastly, a hypothetical question that you'll probably see on a test is, is the salamander more closely related to the pigeon or the perch? And in that situation, you wanna look at how many jumps it has to do. So salamander to perch, is just one. Salamander to pigeon is two. So a salamander is more closely related to the perch. All right, let's do another one. So we look at this one showing common ancestor that starts it, then we go from insects all the way to humans. First of all, what is the ancestral trait? So keep in mind the ancestral trait is the trait that every organism on the cladogram shares. Well, here we see clearly the ancestral trait then is developed from blastula because there's nothing below it that is extending out, okay? Then, what is the derived trait? 
Well, there's plenty, right? We have vertebrae, tetrapod, amniotic egg, hair, and bipedal. All of those things are derived traits. One final practice we're gonna do. What is the trait that separates gorillas and humans? The answer would be bipedal. What could be a possible ancestral trait? So there isn't one pictured. I'll kind of go the easy route. We could go with eukaryotic cells or kingdom animalia. There's lots of options you could do there, but it needs to be something that they all have in common. And finally, is the tiger more closely related to the human or the shark? Once again, see how many jumps you have to do. So tiger to gorilla to human is two. Tiger to lizard to salamander to shark is three. So the correct answer would be human. And we'll do lots more practice with these in class as well. And that is all for your notes.